My name is Brianna Beta, and I am a survivor. I spent three years of my life physically, sexually, and emotionally assaulted by my abuser. And now I reach out and speak to others and help others out. I met him two, year, two months after having my first child. I was 18 years old, and at the beginning it was good. He loved me and my daughter, and so I think that's what made me fall in love. It's because she had a father figure, and he loved both of us, so I fell in love. And from there, it escalated. Started with the verbal abuse. I was fat, I was nasty. I was worthless, no one would want me because I had a kid. And it got deeper, and he would eventually tell me I should be dead. I should kill myself, and I actually did think about killing myself. If he was going to kill me, I was going to kill myself. You know, I had to come up with an excuse for it. You know, it was always my fault. He, he taught me that it was my fault. If I didn't do this certain thing, I wouldn't have got it, but it was always my fault. Like I said, you know, I was just dumb at the beginning. I was stupid, you know. Then I was a bitch. I was a slut. Then it was, I'm going to kill you. You know, you deserve to be dead. Then it was, you know, I was a waste of time. Why should he kill me? You know, I, I'm nothing. I'm a waste. That's basically where it ended with the verbal abuse because, you know, he'd hold a knife to my throat. And because I was such a waste to him, he'd stab the wall or stab the washer, whatever it was, you know, close by and say, yeah, that was you that I was stabbing. Then the physical abuse started. <laughs> And it started with just a punch or a slap or a push. And then it eventually came to a knife, gun. Then he was sexually, sexually assaulting me. If I didn't let him do what he wanted to to me, I would get it. I was beat every day. It's not as easy to yeah. get out. You want to be loved, you know, you want that other person. And, and you hear, like, hear it so much that you know you're not going to find no one like me. You're not going to find anyone else. You're worthless. So it sticks in your head like, okay, you know, I'm going to leave and I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. It's either stay and get this hard love or leave and have no love. And it was more like I'd rather be loved and beat than out there alone. Like, yeah, they go to that honeymoon stage, stage, I love you, I'm sorry, I'll change. And they do for a week or two, and then it's back to the same abusive relationship. And I would always say, you know, this is the last time, this is the last time, and it wasn't. I, I probably left 15 times before I finally left. And the last straw came, he told me he was going to kill me, make my daughters watch, and then he was going to kill them. So that was just it, like hearing those words. Like it wasn't, now, it wasn't like not my life now, it was the kids' too. And after that, I filed for a lifetime restraining order, which I actually was granted. It's a 50-year restraining order. It ends in 2061. It's been three years, and I still, you know, I wear black because I think I'm fat. Somebody can tell me, no, you're skinny. I'm like, no, I'm fat. Like, leave me alone. I'm fat. End of story. And it's hard. It's like the physical is gone. I don't... It doesn't bother me now, but the verbal abuse is still there in the back of my head. And if I fail at something, it's like, he was right. He said you were worthless. You are worthless. I, I try to give my kids everything they want now because that whole bad mom thing plays in the back of my head. I don't remember getting hit in the nose and my blood flowing down, but it's like... The words, you know, you're fat, you're lazy, you deserve to be dead, it still sticks in my head. That's the hardest part about it. You know, I, I actually had to take counseling after the whole fact, after I got out of it, just to help my self-esteem, I guess, and to learn, you know, you're not fat, you're not ugly, and... And those scars heal from the physical, but never from the, ver from the verbal. 
I can't say I'm going to live with it for the rest of my life, but as for now, three years later, I still live with it. So I, I still have my guard up, you know, be, when I pull into my house, I look before I get out. I lock all the doors. You know, I don't trust anyone. It's hard. It's kind of scary. Like depression. <laughs> Actually, I developed anxiety through this whole thing. Like still to this day, I still have anxiety. I have to take anxiety meds because of it. And I've never had to my whole entire life before that till I met him. So I wake up with anxiety sometimes. Like I'll have a nightmare and he'll be the first person that comes to mind. Like I'll wake up and have to look outside and make sure no one's out there. Make sure the doors are locked. And sometimes I feel like giving up because of it. But then I'm like, no, you know, I have to fight my way through it. So I feel like I'm an advocate and I want to save a life. Okay. Just speaking out, like if I could help one person, I'm like, man, I actually succeeded at something in life. You know, I'm not that loser he told me I was or I'm not worthless. You know, once you see or you hit that point where you think, you, you know, okay, this isn't right, get out of it. Once you get that feeling, get out of it. I mean, it's hard, but you could do it. Anyone could do it. If I could do it, you could do it. But there's organizations, there's foundations, there's help, there's helplines, call somebody. You know, you've got to love yourself first before you can love anyone else. I'd rather stay single and not have to deal with that. And I could have ended up dead a long time ago, but I chose to speak up and get out of it.